here we go. Good evening. Uh, it's wonderful to see all of you here for tonight's lecture, which is the 10th TAC faculty lecture in this series. I'm also delighted that Martha and Carl Tack, both class of 1978, with deep William & Mary roots that cover over four generations, uh, and whose generosity allowed us to endow this lecture series are with us uh, this evening. They embraced the simple premise of the lecture series. Our intellectual energy as a university comes first and foremost from the creative activity of our faculty as they conduct research and work with students in the quest for new knowledge and deeper understanding. So we should not hide our light under a bushel, but rather celebrate it and let it shine brightly. Their commitment to their alma mater extends well beyond the generosity in establishing this lecture series. To cite but two examples, Martha is currently on the William & Mary Foundation Board of Trustees, and Carl is a clinical professor of finance in the Mason School of Business and the co-director of the Boley Center for Excellence in Undergraduate Finance. Carl and Martha, somewhere in the front row, thank you. As I mentioned, this is the 10th lecture in this series, and each one has been splendid. And I have steely confidence that this tradition of excellence will continue this evening with tonight's lecturer. Bruce Campbell is the class of 1964 term associate professor of German studies and a fellow at the Center for Liberal Arts. He earned his bachelor's degree from Bowdoin College and then his master's and PhD from the University of Wisconsin at Madison in modern European history with a minor in German literature. He has also studied extensively in Freiburg, Hamburg, and Berlin. And he joined us in Williamsburg as a full-time member of the faculty in 1999. Professor Campbell has served as the Program Director of European Studies and the Associate Chair of the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures. And he's an affiliate faculty member in both European Studies and History. Aside from working on German detective fiction, Professor Campbell is a leading specialist on the Nazi stormtroopers and other Nazi right-wing paramilitary organizations and on Nazi perpetrator biography. His latest monograph project is on radio and modernity in 20th century Germany, which looks at the ways in which people coped with new technologies and technological modernity in the first half of the 20th century by turning tech into a kind of hobby, just the way today's makers and computer hobbyists do. He's the author of one monograph, The Essay Generals and the Rise of, the, of Nazism, the co-editor of two, I'm sorry, has co-edited two volumes and has published numerous articles on subjects as diverse as civil defense, the German youth movement, traditional national use of folk music, and of course, German detective fiction. Professor Campbell received a Plumeria Award for faculty excellence this past spring and was inducted into the Alpha chapter of Phi Beta Kappa in 2005. He has received grants from the National, and the National uh, Endowment for the Humanities, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the German Academic Exchange Service, and the German Scholastic Exchange Service. He has also played an instrumental role in the extraordinarily high number of our students who have gone on to win Fulbright fellowships. And yes, he reads detective fiction in German, in English, and in French. Please join me in welcoming Professor Campbell speaking to us tonight on The Detective Is, Is Not a Nazi. Bruce, welcome. I'll just bask in the applause for a while, thank you. I, actually, this happens all the time in my classes. But. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction. It's a real honor and a privilege to be here. And thank you all for coming. I, I thought I'd be by myself tonight. I'm going to talk to you about German detective fiction tonight, particularly the ways in which it's affected by memory, the weight of the German past. Now, that bit about the German past is actually the specialty of my assistant here. I'd like you to meet the elephant in the room, 
I call him Adolf. Now, I'm not supposed to talk about his weight, but the weight of the German past is substantial. Now, you know, there's this cold going around and stuff. He's going to get a sore throat. But you all can respond. When Adolf trumpets, and unfortunately, that's going to happen a lot because that's the elephant in the room, you can respond. And that's what the noisemakers are all about. So there we go. You can do better than that. There we go. This is going to be important because this actually isn't such a light talk. Sorry. All right. Uh, now, German detective fiction is a lot like American detective fiction or French or any other detective fiction, except when it's not. And thereby hangs a tale <laughs> and a trunk and a trunk. The differences can tell us a lot. My real point tonight is that literature matters, even so-called popular literature. It can tell us important things. So I guess I should ask you, who reads detective fiction? A right, big show of hands, detective fiction. All right, who reads German detective fiction? Ah, thank you. There are a few of you. How about French? Wonderful. I love detective fiction. I read it a lot. I teach about it. It's even my job. And how cool is that? I get to teach what I love. I'm also one of a growing handful of people, just a handful, but a growing handful of people who write about detective fiction. No, I'm strongest on German detective fiction. That's what we're doing tonight. But you can't study anybody's detective fiction without knowing something about the British and the American traditions because they're so important. I also know actually a fair amount about the French tradition. But this is my first point. Detective fiction is a world genre. It's not only a very popular literary area, genre, you can find it around the world. And there's some really good reasons for that. And I'll get to those a little bit later. Now, I've got to point that out, because in this country, we take a fairly proprietary approach to detective fiction. We think we own it. But we don't. Uh, it's part of world literature. There are individual, distinct, and highly important national traditions. They might be influenced by British and American detective fiction, sometimes heavily influenced, but they're independent. They're not just derivative. So my students will know I love to digress. And here comes a big digression. If you've studied detective fiction at all, you probably learned that Edgar Allan Poe, an American author, is the father of modern detective fiction. And the first detective novel was his murder in the Rue Morgue, or on the Rue Morgue published in 1841. Well, it turns out there's a German detective novel called Der Kaliber, The Caliber, written by Adolf Müller, which was published in 1828, a full 13 years before Poe. So all I've got to say is, detective fiction, who's your daddy now? Now, I know what you're thinking, right? I teach a university course about detective fiction. Come on, a university course? That's not important, detective fiction. What about Shakespeare or, or Goethe? Well, I do teach about detective fiction, among other things. And part of my job today is to convince you that it matters. It matters a lot, I think. It's important. First of all, I think we need to teach things that people actually read. The classics are important too, don't get me wrong. 
but people do read detective fiction. It's a huge industry worldwide. There are millions of people, and you've just proven that to me. In 2014, it's the last year for which I have figures, in Germany alone, detective fiction racked up sales of roughly 776 million euros. That's just about $845 million. That gets your attention. Well, that's not the only reason to study something. But parents, there are jobs in this field. Just saying. Second, today in German studies, which is my field, in all of our modern languages, we really focus on culture. And detective fiction can tell you an awful lot about culture. It tends to be realistic. It's set in a realistic, recognizable universe, so therefore it reflects society. Like all literature, it reflects society's mores, values. And of course, detective fiction, it's all about truth and justice and about truth and justice. In German culture, those are not neutral categories, neutral phrases. They have particular resonance because of the weight of the German past. It's the, it's the elephant in the room. So this helps make German detective fiction just a little bit different in some key and, and very interesting ways from other world detective fictions. Still very much a part of detective fiction worldwide. You would recognize it if you passed it on the street. Very much aware of international trends in detective fiction. And of course, the German-speaking world reads a lot of it. So what are we talking about? What is detective fiction? As an academic, I get way too far down in the weeds trying to define it. I'm not going to force that on you tonight. That can get very ugly. We'd have to talk about literary theory. But detective fiction is a living, breathing, bleeding genre. People who write it are always pushing the envelope. But it has some common characteristics. In fact, I just clued you in. It's a genre. A genre is a subset of all literature, a subset that follows common rules, common patterns. In fact, genre is all about rules. Now, mostly they're not written down, mostly they're unspoken, but that's what makes it a genre. That's what makes you able to recognize it. Now, you probably don't worry about specific definitions of detective fiction, but most of you, in fact, have admitted that you read it. And so, whether you know it or not, you know those rules. And that's important in what allows us to enjoy a genre, what allows us to enjoy detective fiction. So, there's kind of a model. You start with a crime. There's no detective fiction without a crime. And usually it's the biggest crime of all, murder. Now, a crime is not just a crime. It's the violation of a taboo. It's a major breach in the fabric of the world around us. It puts our whole world out of whack. So it's a big deal, even when it's a fictional crime. So we've got a crime. Now we need somebody to figure out what happened, maybe even to put things right. So we need a detective. <laughs> and what does a detective do, you may ask? She or he detects. You saw that coming, right? OK. Uh, more importantly, detectives use a rational, logical process for finding the truth. And that's important. You know, we, detective fiction, we call it whodunit. Finding out whodunit 
is at the heart of it. But it's important that it's a rational, logical process. Detective fiction is a product of the Enlightenment, just like the American Constitution, just like the idea of civil rights. So we've got a crime, a detective, and a process of detection, usually rational and logical. Now, if you know detective fiction, if you study it, this is a really overly simplified, but they only let me have an hour and a half tonight. All right, you guys, you gotta live, let us have more time, all right? Okay. You read detective fiction, so I know you can point out individual detective novels that don't exactly follow the rules. Maybe, maybe the detective was the killer. Maybe the killer is known from the very beginning. There are lots of different riffs on this model, but see, that's the important thing. Those riffs are possible because it's a model. There are rules, and that's what makes it a genre. That's a good thing, because that really aids our enjoyment. When we read detective fiction, we love seeing how a new individual author is going to maybe riff on that model, is going to maybe modify it just a little bit, or, or not. It's also reassuring. When, when we pick up a detective novel, we know what to expect. It's like when you go to McDonald's. You order the Big Mac, it's the same Big Mac everywhere you go. And that's comforting today. That's a good thing. Writers like the rule bit because it's a challenge. How do you tell a good story and stick to these rules? And the rules of the detective genre are among the most restrictive of any genre. So it's a real challenge, and that's why all kinds of high culture writers, people who are not known for writing detective fiction, get involved in it. It's a real challenge. But we get something else out of reading detective fiction. On the one hand, we identify with the detective, we live vicariously, we follow the detective in the pursuit of justice, we feel smart because the detective is usually smart and if not lucky. But more important, remember that crime, that murder, that throws our entire world out of whack. It's a big deal. This is literally the originating sin of detective fiction. It's not just a crime, it's a major disruption of our universe. But this allows us to flirt with our fears. There, there's a lot of bad stuff out there and we're worried about it. There's a lot of bad stuff in detective fiction, but it's only a novel. So it's kind of like the roller coaster at Busch Gardens, right? You can flirt with death, but you know you're pretty safe sitting there in bed with your novel. And then usually the world gets put back together again. There's resolution at the end of the novel. There may not always be justice, but at least we know who done it. And that's important. And it's done by a detective like us, somebody we've just identified with for 250 pages. And it's done through a process of reason which is accessible to all of us, because we all have reason. This is pretty reassuring in the darkness of our everyday lives. The world does get put back together again, and sometimes we need that reassurance that that's possible, even though we're kind of afraid it might not be. So all right, reason, justice, a formula. All I've just said is detective fiction's pretty serious stuff, and we need to take it seriously. So why is Germany different? What's different about it? Now, there are lots of subtle differences, and, and 
if I had the two or three hours I really should have had, I'm just saying. I, I could tell you about all those. Uh, German detective fiction displays a very interesting rootedness in place, region. Uh, there's a lot of fear that things are happening to destroy regional cultures, regional identities. Of course, this is not limited to Germany, but it's a specificity of German detective fiction. Uh, there's a very specific German critique of consumption, mass culture, social and economic inequalities. There are a lot of things I could talk about, but tonight I really want to focus on, again, Thank you. See, he's already got a sore throat. The way fiction and memory intersect. So the best way to do this is to show you an illustration. All right? It's even better with sound, trust me. It's even better with sound. <laughs> Trust me. The thing is, you can actually supply the dialogue. Just watch. You, you know what's coming. This is actually a trick a lot of us use when we teach film, you can focus on the images, you can focus on the construction of a piece of film when you turn the dialogue off. And so this often happens in a classroom deliberately. Now, you knew what that was. You don't know what this is, but you knew what the first clip was. This is one of the iconic scenes from Dirty Harry. And you know what he says at the end of the clip, right? Make my day. See, you did know it. You did know it. Uh, 1971 movie, Clint Eastwood in the title role. Make my day. So now I would like to look at a fictional German detective. And we'll take a minute to, uh, to reboot and get this worked up. The contrast is amazing. Now, I have to say I cheated. I selected absolutely the most American, violent, terrible clip from this German series to show you. I will count the yawns in the audience. Here we go. Okay. Watch this. Harry, bitte komm. Sie. Ja, ich. So he says, you, and he says, yeah, me. She's stop! She's stop! Now he's saying, shoot me, shoot me. Have a head. This is not my other school again. Once again, everything turned out OK. This, this particular shot is really important. Now, some of you may recognize this. This is a clip from a long-running German TV series called Derek. Derek. It ran from 1974 to 1998. So 
281 episodes, and it's still in syndication around the world. It's one of, probably one of the most, most popular TV series worldwide ever. Uh, this comes from an episode called On a Monday Morning from 1986 with Horst Tappert, of course, in the title role as Derek. Now, again, this is probably the most violent clip in the entire <laughs> series. But look what happened or didn't happen. Derek looks like your grandfather. He looks older than my grandfather. He does have a gun, although how many of you actually saw it? It's only on screen for a little bit, and it's this little tiny gun. Nobody gets shot. There aren't even any snarky comments. Well, that went well again. This is not the kind of detective we're used to. But here's the point. Um, Derek is not this. Derek is your grandfather. Derek is Derek because he's not this. This is, of course, very deliberate. Now, you might be saying, he's gone too far. He's gone too far. How did I get from simple, innocent little detective fiction to the Nazis? Well, that's kind of what I'm talking about tonight. This is not a big leap. It's not a big leap at all. And it's why there's an elephant in the room. Derek is as far from Heydrich as you can get and still speak German. And that's why Derek is Derek. Now, not all fictional German detectives are Derek. They're not all grandfathers. But just about all of them, since 1945, have gone out of their way not to be Nazis, not to look like Nazis, not to remind people of the Nazis. And that's the point. This is the big difference in German detective fiction. Now, this is a real dilemma. Germans love detective fiction. The German-speaking world loves detective fiction. It's widely, wildly popular. But there's a real problem here. In a detective story, you ask the reader to identify with the detective, to live vicariously through the detective as she or he looks for the truth. Problem is, any German-speaking reader with any understanding of recent history, and that's just about all of them, knows that there was a close link between the police and Nazi crimes. Heydrich was not just Heinrich Himmler's right-hand man. He was not just one of the main architects of the Holocaust. He was the chief of the entire German police from 1936 until he was assassinated in 1942. He was also the president from 1940 until 1942 of Interpol, the international police organization. <sighs> Organizationally, the Nazis just lumped all the police together. Uniformed cops on the beat, political, poli uh, excuse me, detectives, even firemen, together with the political police, that means the Gestapo and the SD. Worse, many of the members of those organizations and of the Einsatzgruppen, the very 
infamous murder squads who carried out a large part of the Holocaust in Eastern Europe were originally police officers. Some few of you may actually know, oh, here we go. This is a shot from 1933 showing police in the funny hats together with Nazi stormtroopers and SS in the dumpy uniforms. Some of you may also know that entire battalions of police officers were put together during the war to carry out murder in Eastern Europe. Of course, this is the famous book by Christopher Browning, Ordinary Men. Bad cops, bad Nazis, bad dogs. This can't go well. With this background, you can't ask a normal reader to identify with this kind of detective. And this is the problem. It's a problem for readers, it's a problem for writers. Now, I know a lot about, a lot about this side of things, about the history. Uh, I've written about the Nazi stormtroopers, I write about Nazi perpetrators. Um, believe me right now when I tell you, without going into too many of the details, because I actually wanted to talk about that, and they said, no, they'll run screaming out of the room. Uh, the German police were intimately implicated in Nazi crimes from the very first day to the very last. Not all policemen as individuals, but as institutions, the police were central part, a central part of these crimes. So I kind of lied to you, or the poster lied to you. Uh, in real life, the detective was a Nazi. And I just didn't want to plaster all of Williamsburg with signs that said the detective was a Nazi. I, It's only the fictional detectives who have to not be Nazis, who get to be marked as not Nazis. And of course, I'm not speaking about the German police today. I'm speaking historically. But again, the point is, you can't ask anyone in the German-speaking world to identify with a detective because of this memory. So you see what I'm really talking about is not just Fiction, it's not just literature, it's about how literature and memory intersect. My assistant, Adolf, the elephant in the room, represents the memory of the German past and how that memory is reflected in everyday life, including in the genre of popular fiction. Now, you know what an elephant in the room stands for. It's something that is so big, I didn't say fat, that even when it's not mentioned specifically, everyone is thinking about it. The memory of the Nazi past haunts modern Germany today. So again, this is a huge dilemma. Germans want to read detective fiction, they love to read detective fiction, but it's a genre that is centered on the police. It's a genre that's all about truth and justice. Detective fiction in German has no innocence. Yet again, it's widely popular. Remember, $845 million a year in Germany alone. Not only is there a lot of detective fiction written by Germans in German. The German market translates a huge amount of world detective fiction. In fact, many of the leading authors of German detective fiction are also translators of the genre. Now this is jarring, isn't it? We're going for the Nazis, from the Nazis to Pika Biermann. Pika Biermann is one of these leading authors, one of my favorites, but she also makes a large part of her living translating from both English and French. 
she and all of her colleagues have to find a way around this dilemma. How do you have detectives that German speakers can read? Now, the easy way is to duck the problem altogether and just set your novel someplace else. Problem solved. An American detective. Everybody in Europe knows that this is a particularly violent society. So you can have a detective break all the rules as long as he's in New York. This is the central premise of a series of what's literally pulp fiction. This is a kind of fiction that we don't really have much in the United States today. It's published in, it's about this big, so about half of a sheet of eight and a half by 11 paper. It's published on pulp paper, newsprint. They come out, I think they now come out four times a year. There are a gazillion different authors who write anonymously in this series, but it's all about G-Man Jerry Cotton, an FBI agent in New York. And Jerry can break the rules. He can really mix it up. That's is actually what most German detective fiction did in the 1950s and early 60s. But then something happened. For those of you who are my age or maybe a little older, we have a technical term for this. It's the 60s, man. Lots of reform-minded, young, liberal, left-wing intellectuals decided that they wanted to change the world. And all of these folks had been reading detective fiction written by a pair of Swedish writers and political activists. My cheval and pur voilu. I think I got that right. I practiced today. You know, on the internet, you can find pronunciations of everything. <laughs> it's incredible. They were both committed leftists. That's my on your left, Pirach with his hand on the typewriter. And they decided that detective fiction was a great way to criticize problems they saw in Swedish society and reach the masses, change their consciousness. Here's some of their books. Because they wanted to change the world. And believe me, all of my leftist German college friends when I studied in Germany, the first thing, you know, you get to know somebody and they'd come up to you and they'd say, here, you got to read this. And it wasn't Marx. It was Sjö Wallen Wallu. And so, and by the way, there's a long tradition in detective fiction about, of, of social criticism. So that it's not unusual that detective fiction would be used this way. But lots of young German leftists, progressives agreed, you know what? One of the things that we did to re-educate Germany after World War II was to really push academic exchanges. Fulbright, you've heard of that, right? And so lots and lots of German and Austrian students had come to the US, had come to Britain, had come to France to study. And so they started reading detective fiction there. Then they started reading Chauvel and Wallu. This was going to help them change the world. You say you want a revolution. But that meant they had to do a couple things. New York was out. If you were going to raise the consciousness of the German masses, if you were going to criticize German society, you had to have novels that were set in Germany. You had to bring the detective back home. 
you also had to address this problem of memory directly. Thank you, thank you. Don't you folks up there have noisemakers? <laughs> Come on, help me out here. Work, work with me. Yeah. This memory is everywhere. You can't escape it. All right. They had to deal with this issue directly. They had, as authors and with their fictional characters, they had to distance themselves from the Nazi past, and by extension, distance themselves from the generation of their fathers who had, had been in the war, had often been Nazis. This is a key aspect of the 60s in Germany. It's an aspect that was almost completely absent in this country. The key question in the 60s in Germany was, Daddy, what did you really do in the war? And so this is a part of that as well. Now, sometimes it gets di addressed directly in these novels, but mostly in fairly small ways. You know, there are lots of minor scenes where detectives, the hero detective is shown in conflict with his bosses, with his colleagues, this older authoritarian Nazi-trained generation of police officers. Now, of course, this fits with a long-standing convention in detective fiction. The detective is usually, you know, a half step outside of society, out of step a little bit with society, in conflict, a maverick. Neither Sherlock Holmes nor Miss Marple are really normal. So again, this, is, this still fits the larger rules of the game, but in Germany they take on a specific resonance. Ways had to be found to remove even the suspicion that a detective might have been, or might act like, or re might, might remind you too much of the Nazis. So the little things were not enough. There had to be something kind of fundamental. And here, a couple trends in world detective fiction just happened at the same time and really helped out German authors. The main one was the rise of the female detective. This is a product of second wave feminism. Some of you have read, for example, Sarah Paretsky, right? There are many, many, many other examples in uh, American detective fiction, German detective fiction, Richard Hay, Doris Gerke, Along with that, a few years later, came the invention of openly gay detectives. Pika Bierman, who you've just met, wrote openly gay detectives as well as female detectives. Both of these trends were a way out, and female detectives in particular are extremely popular in German detective fiction. Women people of non-mainstream sexu sexuality of any kind are very clearly not Nazis. These were groups persecuted by the Nazis. So it's clear, your detective is not a Nazi in this way. There's other ways to do it too. Other authors wrote manifestly fat or just plain slow moving detectives. Simon Polt is an example. Others wrote counterculture pot-smoking detectives, Friedrich Ani, and of course, grandfatherly detectives, Derek, and several others who are actually much better written. Either way, individual authors always had to choose. They had to find a way to make a detective that their readers could actually identify with, could, could tolerate. So the bottom line here, to paraphrase Theodore Adorno, is after Auschwitz, you couldn't write a violent German detective. Even today, state violence, and that's what we're talking about. You know, most fictional detectives in German f fiction are actually police officers, and that's really a function of the German or, or Austrian or Swiss legal systems. 
we like private detectives, but there they're almost always police detectives. State violence is still a huge taboo in German-speaking society today, specifically in German. German detective fiction illustrates this very clearly. This is as important in literature and popular culture as it is in German foreign policy, and for exactly the same reasons. So again, you would recognize German detective fiction if you met it on the street. We find the same thirst for justice, the same fear of crime, the same use of rational detection to find the truth that we find in all detective fictions. When we read detective fiction, we are all children of the Enlightenment. And yet, just as clearly, there are some specific differences in German detective fiction. There's the omnipresence of a terrible past filled with the worst injustices imaginable and a burning desire to make up for this past, a fierce determination that it should not be allowed to happen again. Even in the face of a resurgence of right-wing populism, which is a factor now in most industrial societies. You all know that we're about to have an election, right? Like all fiction, detective fiction is not a perfect mirror for society. That would be too easy and it would be too boring. But it is a mirror. Like all literature worth reading, it requires interpretation. But it is worth reading. It can tell us a lot about society, about its values, about how it deals with truth and justice, and with the specter of its own memory. So thank you. With that, Adolf will say goodbye, even though he's going to remain in the room. Now, there's a postscript here. Because I hope you're sitting there thinking, can I read some of this? I want to read some of this. Where do I go to read some of this? I got a couple ideas. Now, I already told you, we don't translate a lot of world detective fiction in the US. If you speak German, I've got a couple page list that I routinely send to friends. And my list here in English is a little bit shorter. You know what, folks? This is another argument for why we all need to learn languages besides our native language. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, that was an unplanned witness. That was. We miss a lot if we don't. There are some things that have been translated. So first I'll mention Friedrich Dürrenmatt, who is one of the icons of high culture literature. But he also wrote detective fiction. There are two books available at University of Chicago Press. Really fascinating and, and very, very good stuff. Uh, you might also know that one of his detective novels, called The Pledge, was first made into a movie in Europe, and then there's a remake in English in the United States, 2001, starring Jack Nicholson and Benicio del Toro, called The Pledge. Another one of the real grand authors of German detective, German language detective fiction, is a writer named Friedrich Glauser. And strangely enough, he's also Swiss. He wrote in the 1930s. A fascinating modernist writer is not very well known today in the English speaking world, rather well known in the German speaking world. He died of a stroke in 1938 after being a poet, a writer, a morphine addict, a soldier in the French Foreign Legion, a dishwasher, a miner, a gardener, and a metal patient. See, undergraduates, you will get jobs too. He wrote really interesting detective fiction, very much in the spirit of his contemporary, Georges Simenon in France. In fact, he's often called the Swiss Simenon. Uh, 
a number of his books, you see one here, that's in German, a number of them had been translated into English. Sadly, some of my favorite contemporary writers, Wolfgang Schorlau, Oliver Bottini, Richard Hay, and a bunch of others have not been translated. But a few have. Let me start with one of my favorites, Doris Gerke. Only one of her novels has been translated. In English, it's called How Many Miles to Babylon. It's great. It launched the career of her fictional detective series around Bella Block, which has now become a TV series in Germany. The only thing is, if you read uh, How Many Miles to Babylon, it's not for the kids. The detective is not violent, but the crimes are. I can mention others, Ulrich Ritzel, Volker Kutscher. Volker Kutscher is an interesting case. He's the leading author of a sub-subgenre of German detective fiction set in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. In other words, when there were real Nazis running around. It's kind of an odd thing. It doesn't quite, but a little bit contradicts my thesis it's really forcing readers to put their finger right where it hurts the most. And that's what it's all about. I'm writing an article about that. Invite me back in a couple years. <laughs> I'm also a particular fan of Pika Biermann, whom we've met. Again, only one of her novels has been translated, Violetta. There's also Ingrid Noll, not my cup of tea, but she's there. Wolf Haas, Austrian writer, bitterly, bitingly funny. And then I'll close with two other authors who come about as close as any German authors do to writing what we would call hard-boiled fiction. The first is Jakub Arjauni, who wrote a series around a Turkish-German detective, Kemal Kayankaya, and five of those novels are in translation. Now see, this doesn't mess up my thesis because Kayankaya, even though he's a little bit violent as a detective, He's a Turkish German. And so he's very clearly not a Nazi. Uh, by the way, Jakub Arjani is a pseudonym. Jörg Fauser, two of his novels, The Snowman or Raw Material. And finally, I can't talk about detective fiction in German without a shout out to the longest running TV series in the world. And it's still going on. A police series started in 1970 called Tatort, Scene of the Crime. They haven't changed their generic since 1970, which is kind of fun. They don't come with English subtitles. They, you, can, you can find them with German subtitles. You can stream them from the ARD website. Uh, they're also available on YouTube. Shh. Uh, they might be fun even if you don't speak German. Uh, they also, by the way, have extremely high production values, at least today. Uh, some of them are extremely well done. You'll kill me for, some of you will kill me for saying this, but it's really about the only part of German TV that is really worth watching. But it is worth watching. <laughs> it's great. Now, I'm told that the list I went through is on the website. If you want to look some of this up, I think the William & Mary Bookstore is doing a display of some of these novels. Otherwise, you've got the internet in your back pocket. So about the only thing left for me to do now is to thank a whole bunch of people Oh, yeah. And I have a lot of people to thank. I really want to thank my assistant, Adolf. He was actually in the room anyway, but I'm very happy he could help out tonight. And isn't that a great elephant? Yeah. I want to thank my colleagues, too. 
in particular, Ann Rasmussen, Ron Schechter, I see you, Julia Pacini, and Sasha Prokhorov. He's up there. They supported my candidacy for the TAC lecture, and I'm very grateful. I also want to thank the chair of my department, Professor Maurice Fauvel. And I want to give a special shout out to the entire Department of Modern Languages and Literatures, those fedora-wearing teacher heroes. Stand up and take a bow. I could thank many, many more colleagues around the world. And of course, I especially want to thank Carl and Martha Tack for making all of this possible. This is a terrific thing. It's wonderful. Last but not least, there is an entire creative team who have struggled to try and make me look good. <laughs> Sorry, guys. But next time, next time. Absolutely terrific, wonderful design, wonderful help with the slides, with everything. Can I have a round of applause for everyone? And thank you. All right, enough's enough. Because see, I lied to you. It's not really the end. There are questions. So give it your best shot. And, and since this is being streamed live, uh, I think we may get questions out of the cloud even. So we'll, we'll see what that looks like. There are, there are students with microphones. Um, Uh, so I was wondering if, even after the war, uh, Nazis or neo-Nazis make any appearances in German uh, detective fiction, even as uh, villains or adversaries? The answer is yes. Uh, it's a tricky thing, but there is a recognizable group of modern novels that either feature Nazis or neo-Nazis as villains, or derive part of the plot from the past. So there may have been murders actually committed during the Nazi period that are causing new murders today, something like that. So absolutely, that, that is a part of it. I shouldn't say this, but those novels, they tend to be written by historians who didn't find day jobs. But it, very much so, there, there, there are any number of them. Hi, I was wondering how long before there was a Jewish detective in uh, German detective fiction? That's a great question. You know, I'm sure there is, but I cannot think of a single one. Now, uh, there's actually been some kind of interesting scholarship about this in history and in cultural studies, but written by historians, not focusing on detective fiction, but looking at what German historians have written about the Nazi past. Uh, I should preface this by saying that the Germans, German historians have been absolutely exemplary in facing even the worst aspects of their past without flinching. But they have tended to focus on the perpetrators and less so on the victims. So I, I love the question. I'm really going to think about that for a bit. I think this is a reflection of that perhaps understandable focus on oneself rather than on the victims. But you're absolutely right. You'd think there would be more Jewish detectives. I know of Jewish detectives in novels set in this time period written by Americans, interestingly enough. But that, that's, just, that's about the only answer I could give. It's a great question. 
We have a question from one of our online viewers that's been watching the live stream. In the clip you showed from Derek, one of the characters came onto the screen with a beaten and bloodied face. So are Germans in general okay with that sort of violence? My answer to that is I think less than Americans. Uh, on the other hand, you know, crime is bad and you have to show that. But he was beaten up off screen and the key thing in the sense of my talk is he wasn't beaten up by the police, he was beaten up by the bad guys. So uh, just as there's a much lower tolerance for violence, I think there's also, in general, a lower tolerance for gore. Now, you can get Friday the 13th, the movie, in Germany. You can find any slasher movie, any kind of gore-drenched video game you want, but in detective fiction, and particularly when it comes to state violence or violence by state agencies, I think that indeed there is a much lower tolerance. Yes. Bruce, there are a number of uh, non-German writers, say Cannon and Kerr and others, who write about German detectives. Would you talk a little bit about the comparisons there? You know, I'd love to, but I've had to spend so much of my time reading the German detective fiction. Alfred Kerr's Berlin novels have been sitting next to my bed for more than 10 years. I just haven't gotten to them. Sorry, American detective fiction is not my department. I know it's there. There's some very interesting things that have done. There's a fairly short series, for example, that features a detective duo in occupied France, one detective is a French detective and the other is a member of the SD, a German, a Nazi. Uh, that's interesting, of course, I, I know about Alfred Kerr that there are a whole bunch of these. That's not my department, <laughs> sorry. <coughs> I knew that was coming. I, I, I was gonna read the Wikipedia version. I, <coughs> TV. For that last TV show that you played the clip for to tort, since it's been running for such a long time, is it possible to detect a shift in the mentality of how they address the elephant in the room uh, over the decades? Yes, I think so. Uh, I, this is an entire academic specialty. I know of three or four articles about it. I haven't looked at every episode since 1970, although with the help of YouTube, I'm going to try. <laughs> I think there have been shifts. One of the most interesting thing is, I, I, you know, when the Cold War ended, when 1989 happened, when the two Germanys were unified, a lot of things began to change. Now, maybe we just kind of fastened on that because it was something we could hang our interpretive hats on. Uh, part of it does come, I think, from changing circumstances. Eventually, German detective fiction is going to become a lot more like American detective fiction. It kind of has to because of the weight of the American film and publishing industry. And I, there have been some really tentative experiments with this on Tatort, spe specifically uh, the Tatorts set in Hamburg. One of the reasons this has been able to go on for so long and be so successful in Germany, in Austria, and in Switzerland, radio and TV is run by kind of semi-independent, semi-private, semi-public, regional media authorities. And the Tot Ort series is produced independently by all of these different regional media authorities in Germany, but also in Switzerland and Austria. So there's a lot of variation. Uh, the ones in, set in a given city tend to have the same characters, at least over a long period of time. The ones in Hamburg have been pushing the envelope a little bit with violence. Uh, particularly a, a certain detective named Chiller, Nomen es Omen. Uh, 
he starred in an episode that was just about as blood-drenched as anything you could see on TV tonight in the United States. And that set off a controversy in the German media for weeks. And when I say media, I'm talking about the leading German newspapers. Die Zeit, Frankfurter Allgemeine, Süddeutsche Zeitung. This was an entire nation going through a period of soul searching. Uh, I haven't seen a recent chiller lately. This happened about two years ago, I think. But it was a big deal. So yeah, there are changes happening. That, that you can see it a little bit in print, too. But it's slow. He's going to be around for a long time. Thank you. Uh, some folks up here have been waiting patiently. Yeah. Uh, so first, Bruce, thanks for the, the really thought-provoking talk. I'm going <clears> to <throat> confess to not being a detective fiction consumer. This so can change. This the, uh, it's totally changing change. right now as yeah. we speak. Uh, but I found myself thinking about um, programs here in the U.S. like, you know, um, Law and Order or CSI in all of its 12 versions, right? Uh, and I'm thinking about the way in which, um, from my perspective as a non-consumer, they tend to pathologize crime as sort of the... Um, uh, a really pathologized individuals, mm -hmm. right? Individual moral failings that then get solved by this, by you know, rationale and, and deductive reasoning, and really then reinscribe a sense in a justice system that that is premised on on finding out the truth about guilt. But I kept going back to this phrase that you used early on in that one of those early slides about detective fiction beginning with a crime that sort of tears at the social fabric. And I've been thinking about crime as the result of an already torn social fabric, right? And, and I guess the question that I'm finding myself asking about detective fiction is, does it exist as a fantasy wherein we get to simply reside in a world momentarily where our social system works, where our law and our legal system mm. works? Yeah. Or are, is there a detective fiction are there, is there an attempt by detective fiction to have us think about a social fabric that's already damaged? Yes, absolutely. Uh, in fact, uh, the Swedish couple of whom I spoke were writing very much in that vein. They wanted to use detective fiction to, so, to show how social forces, economic forces, were leading to crime, were, were causing crime. They wanted to show how parts of the economy were actually acting in a criminal fashion and not being punished. And you do find that point of view reflected in a lot of German detective fiction. Uh, detective fiction is really interesting for a lot of reasons. Let's go back to the Dirty Harry clip. Oh. I may not get it to play. Oh. Every day for the last 10 years, Loretta there has been giving me a large black coffee. Today she gives me a large black coffee, only it's got sugar in it. Now already, sugar. we know what's going on. I just came back to complain. We have black boys thugs, guns down. evil black men, Say what? and they're even going after white women. And so we've got We're an upright, dare I say, stiff, masculine guy with a big one, Smith and Wesson, Smith and Wesson. <laughs> who is going to restore order in our dreams. And of course, we can see whose lives matter in this. So to me, that represents the projection of certain fears onto the screen as well as an attempt to reassure us that we can make it right, particularly with the help, in this case, of Smith & Wesson. So I think there's a, a prescription of how we're supposed to behave, too. Um, although, again, I, I'm not a specialist in American detective fiction, certainly not in film, but I think that particular reading just jumps out at us. Uh, 
if you want to get even a little more Freudian, there's a Go clip ahead. that I chose not to show. Make my day. Where he's holding the gun and saying how big it is and how powerful it is. I can talk about Freud. He spoke German. <laughs> yeah. uh, one more down here, if, if we could. Cause. Um, so, so great know, question. I know you're mentioning earlier that a lot of American works will be translated into German so that Germany can also read you know, international versions. How do they deal with like American versions of detectives where they're a little bit more violent and a little bit more bloody? An interesting question. Uh, let me reply first with a little anecdote. I have my favorite bookstore in Berlin. It specializes in detective fiction. It's got two rooms. The first room has detective fiction in German. The second room has detective fiction in English and French. And so a lot of detective fiction fans in Germany just can't wait. They want to get their hands on the original. And like I said, a lot of them were actually exposed to this on a high school exchange, in college, stuff like that. Now, how they deal with the Americans, well, violent Americans are reassuring, right? For all Europeans. That's, it shows them why they're better off being Europeans. <laughs> it's also, I think, a guilty pleasure. Um, there's something about violence that we find attractive. We, not, we might not be happy about that, proud about that, but this lets you sort of have your cake and eat it too. On the other hand, I think there is a certain amount of discomfort when things get too out of hand. Uh, in fact, I'd, I'd, I'd be interested right now to go back and look up reviews of Dirty Harry when it came out and see how German audiences reacted to that. Seeing it today, through the eyes of somebody in 2016, I, well, I'm blown away. Sorry. <laughs> um, but it's a great question. OK, we'll go back. Hi, so I'm actually going to go back to the question that you answered before that one um, and talking about how detective fiction um, tends to address social issues in a certain light. And earlier in your presentation, you mentioned how specifically in German detective fiction, there is an emphasis on preserving um, regional culture and regional heritage and the history that comes along with all of the different um, sections of Germany because it's so split and so diverse um, just in terms of the north, south, east, west. In the most recent um, works that are coming out, are you finding that any of that is playing into the refugee crisis and the just kind of em emotional and political turmoil in Europe in general? Or are authors tending to um, stay away from that or just not getting into it yet? It's too new, it's too recent. Uh, these are major issues, of course, in, in German culture in general, in many European cultures in general. They do get reflected in detective fiction. Now, I've got to confess, I'm an impoverished college professor, so I usually wait to buy the books when they're in the paperback edition, and that takes a couple years. So I don't know yet how much of a big thing it's going to turn out to be. It's an issue that's already been addressed, and in fact, has been addressed in detective fiction for, well, at least since the mid-70s. Uh, I'd be very surprised if it didn't feature prominently. Uh, detective fiction is a great way for talking about current political issues, uh, particularly the author I mentioned, Wolfgang Schorlau. I went to a reading of his in Berlin several years ago, and he told the audience essentially that he was the luckiest man in the world. He could spend two whole years, if he wanted, researching an issue before he put it into his novels. No journalist in the world has that much time to get deeply into a subject. And he writes novels that are always centered around very, very topical questions. So he has one that focuses on the pharmaceutical industry 
and how they manipulate social media to sell their products. He has another focused on the potential implication of the intelligence services in Germany in neo-Nazi crimes. And it goes on from there. Um, he has another that focuses on the animal rights movement. So he's, he's able, and he does this very consciously, he's able to use his fiction as a kind of super journalism. And in fact, the back of his novels, he always has a bibliography and usually a link to his website with basically proof that the fictional things he's talked about are actually happening in real life. So, absolutely. I'll take one more question, yeah. Would, would... <laughs> Don't fight. But oh. I, I think we've got, the, the mic is up there, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Um, um, I just have a question. You talk about like the popular culture, like detective uh, novels subject to the social current. So uh, you talk about the social current during the war, like the Nazi uh, thing, but is there like a subjection to Cold War culture? Uh, for, for instance, like uh, the um, German is in the center of the Cold War, uh, which is split up in East German and West German. Is there any like um, uh, uh, conscious or unconscious subjection to that current? Uh, it, it is, it's a topic in some German detective fiction. Now, we make a distinction between detective fiction and, say, spy fiction. And so this topic could go either way, and you find it in both places. It is a topic, um, interestingly enough, one of the first episodes of Tatort took the detectives into East Germany. And it was very much about East-West differences. When German unification happened, one of the first episodes to come out in 1990 featured a team of detectives from East Germany working together with a team of detectives from West Germany. So absolutely, it's there. If we had more time, there was you know, most of this fiction, all of this fiction I've talked about today is really West German or today German-German. But there was an East German, a socialist detective fiction, which is fascinating. Uh, it really faced a problem, not only with dealing with the Nazi past, that was easy for them because they said, we were the victims, we weren't Nazis, we were the good guys. But where does crime come from in a socialist country? If you've got socialism, you can't have crime. The only way you can have crime is if it's recondite capitalist interests or people who just haven't gotten with the program, who have false consciousness. So you've got to have detective fiction, but you're not supposed to have crime. Interestingly enough, a lot of the detective fiction produced in East Germany was actually subsidized by the Ministry of the Interior, the police themselves. To teach people that the police was your helper and friend. So I, that was the last question, the last answer. Thank you all. And thank you very much. That may have been the last question and answer. What was meant was that was the last question and answer in this room. Upstairs, we will continue the conversation um, over refreshments. And I would like to all of us to thank not just Adolf for uh, being here, uh, the wonderful elephant in the room, uh, but for, for Bruce for a talk that was simultaneously elegant and engaging and thought-provoking. Thank you very much, Bruce.